And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Ryan Metzler. Hey everyone, it's Ryan Metzler here again, and today we're going to be taking a look at a Top 100 game. We're going to take a look at Stone Age by Michael Tummelhofer. Uh, and with art by Michael Menzel, and a game published by Rio Grande Games. This is a worker placement game for two to four players. Uh, plays pretty quick and is really easy to learn. Uh, and has some really interesting gameplay. I think it's really good for a gateway game into worker placement. So real quick, we'll take a look at what you get inside this box and how the game plays, and then we'll come back here and get my final opinions on it. Here you can see the components for Stone Age. Now this is going to be a pretty basic worker placement game uh, in which players are going to be placing workers and then rolling dice to resolve a lot of the actions out on the board. So you can see here that each player has their own little player mat. Uh, and on this player mat there's going to be a lot of important information. First you're going to have your five starting meeples that you get. You'll start with 12 food, which you'll need to feed your people. And then you can see that there are conversion ratios for die rolls here. So you'll see food, wood, brick, stone, and gold. And when you roll dice, you're gonna divide the total value of your pips by these numbers, and that will tell you how many of the good you get, uh, depending on which one you're rolling for. So for example, if you rolled 12 and you were rolling for food, you would divide by two and you'd get six food. And you'd take that and put it in your supply. You're also going to have spaces for your tools, uh, spaces for huts as you buy them, although you're not limited to these spaces. And then on this part here, it's going to tell you how to score points at the end of the game based on different factors. Now, the game, as I said, is a worker placement game, and we're looking at the setup for four players here. Uh, these huts down here are going to be uh, in piles, dependent on how many players there are, and the top one of each of these will be visible. On a player's turn, depending on who's the starting player, which will be marked by the big kahuna guy here, uh, they'll have that thing. Player, uh, the star player is going to place some of their workers on any one of the spots on the board. Now, I'm going to slide this down a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. Uh, the board is divided into different spaces. There are several spaces here that have one time actions and only one player can place on that. That is going to be the farm here, or I don't know what it's called, the fields. You can place a guy here and it'll give you one permanent food every turn, which detracts one from the amount of food you have to pay on a turn when it's the end of the time to feed your people. The two-person spot here requires you to place two people, so if I were yellow I could place two people here, and that will get me a new guy when I resolve my action. So this is the love hut. You place two guys in, or a guy and a girl in, and three meeples come out. You have another spot here, maybe red places here, and they get a tool. And tools will allow you to use them once per turn to increase your die roll, one die roll. And you put this on your player mat to keep track of the fact that you have a tool. You also have the generic areas here. So these areas can be placed on by anybody, and these are resource collection areas. Now, you'll see that there are limited numbers of spots. For example, there's seven spots in each of these areas for woods, brick, stone, and gold. And any number of people can place in the hunting area to get food. But when you place here, you can place any meeples that can fit as long as all seven spots aren't full. Uh, so maybe uh, blue places three guys out in order to get wood. And you're going to keep going around in order placing like this until everybody's placed all of their currently available meeples. Now, there are a couple extra spots that are going to be uh, required to have resources in order to use. You can see that there are these cards down here. Um, these will replenish each round, but I'll cover those shortly. And then there are these huts right here, which you're going to pay resources in order to get. Now, you'll see above the cards there is a generic resource symbol. This means one of any resource. You would place your worker here, and when it came time to resolve all of the workers, you would pay one resource and resolve this card. Now, if you look at these cards closer, you can see that they have several things on them. For example, this one at the set top says you'll roll two dice and divide by the number for wood, and you'll get that many wood. If you have the next one below it, you can see that, or at the bottom here, you can see at the end of the game, this one's going to be worth two times the number of meeples you have at the end of the game. So you'll see two and times the number of meeples you have. The second card here, you can see, would cost two resources. So if you were to place on there, when it came to your turn, you'd pay the two resources. Uh, and it's going to give you a multiplier at the end of the game for the permanent amount of food you have on this track. But uh, more importantly, or at least more importantly at the time, you're going to roll one die per player in the game. Uh, and then you're going to choose a die, starting with the player who rolled, in order to get a benefit. So you can get a permanent food or a tool, some gold, a stone, a brick, or a wood. And the last player to choose is going to get the worst of these things, most likely. Uh, the next one is very similar, giving you a benefit for food, uh, and also gives you a permanent food when you take it, but it costs three resources, and the last card here will cost four resources, will only give you one food immediately, not a permanent food, but a food, uh, but has this symbol at the bottom. You can see there's this grass field with a symbol on top of it. For the different number of these symbols you collect in cards, at the end of the game you will get the square of the different number of symbols you have. So if you collect eight of these different symbols, you can get 64 points at the end of the game, which is kind of a big deal. 
The huts cost specific resources to get. So you'll see this one here costs you three wood in order to get it. But each turn at the top right there, you can see it generates a wood and it will cost you three points. So you'd place a guy on here and when it got to your turn, you'd pay the resources, get the points, and each future turn you'd get a wood. This one costs us two stone and a wood, but gets you 13 points. Uh, and this one here costs five resources, which have to be of four different types. You can kind of see that on here. It shows you four different types in the brackets here, and it costs five resources. And the number of points you get are going to be based on the uh, conversion ratios of those things. So for example, if you used a gold, you'd get six points, and a stone would get you five points. Let's say you used another stone, so you're up to 16. One of these would be 20, and 23 if you used one, two, one, and one for your five resources. It would be 23 points, and you would take your points accordingly after having paid for it. So that's how those work. So basically, once everyone has placed their workers, you're going to start resolving with whoever has this, and they're going to resolve all of their actions in whichever order they so choose. Uh, you usually take these ones over here first because the tools can be used later on your turn. Then you're going to resolve and get all your resources. So maybe blue's turn to resolve, green's already gone. And it's Blue's turn to resolve. They would roll for their wood, and they'd roll. And they I got 6, 10, 13. I could use my tool to make it 14, but that won't help. 13 divided by 3 gives me 4 wood, which I then place onto my player sheet. We'd keep doing this, everyone taking their actions, until no one has any actions left, and then we would move on. Passing the big kahuna to the player to your left, and they will start a new round by placing workers again. You're going to go on in this manner until either one of two things happens. Either you won't have enough cards to refill this, and once these are taken, the ones that are left over will slide to the right, and you'll refill all of the remaining ones, or these, one of these piles of huts is gone, in which case you finish that round out, and then the game ends. So as you buy these, they'll be removed, and you'll flip the next one up, and once one of these piles runs out, the game will end. At the game end, you're going to score points based on several things. First off, you'll have had all your points that you got from your huts. In addition, you're going to get your points for the different types of symbols you have on your cards, and you're going to get the multipliers you have from cards that you've picked up. So if you have a bunch of food, uh, permanent food, it would be good for you to have all of these multipliers for food. Now there's one more important aspect to the game, and that's feeding your people, which I didn't cover, but at the end of each round, after everyone has taken all of their actions, you must feed your people, which is why it's important to go hunting for food, uh, but you start the game with 12 food. At the end of each round, you have to pay one food for each meeple that you have, so if you're breeding, uh, you're going to have to pay more food. But if you get these permanent food, you have to pay less. Each one of these permanent foods you have will detract one from the amount of food you have to pay. So you'll need to pay these food at the end of the round. At the end of the first round, it's either going to be five or six, and that will go up throughout the game. If you cannot pay your food in food, you can pay in resources. Your people can eat wood or brick or stone or gold. Uh, basically, you sell it in order to get the, the needed food. If you can't pay with resources or food, you lose 10 points. Now, it's a straight 10 points, not 10 points per food, which has led to an interesting strategy of people simply not feeding their people, ignoring the feeding, and trying to get more than the 10 points uh, that they would get or they would lose from food in points by using those meeples for other things. So there is a starvation strategy. I'm uh, not a proponent of using it simply because it just doesn't feel natural, but it's out there. So basically, after you've gone through and you've collected all of your points for your cards and for your huts and for things you've done throughout the game, whoever has the most points will be the winner. Well, there you have it. That is Stone Age, a pretty simple uh, gateway game and a great gateway game for worker placement. Uh, this is one of the games that really got me hooked on gaming, and I traded it away uh, after quite some amount of playing and then decided that I liked it so much that I wanted it back, uh, and now I have it in my collection again. Uh, it's really, really easy to learn. Uh, it scales really well from two players up to four players. I know that's not a big range, but uh, I really like it as a two-player game, and I don't feel like it loses much as a four-player game. Um, it does have some scaling rules for two players where you can't place on all of the different spots, which really tightens the game up a little bit. Uh, and all in all, it's just a great game uh, even for people who are in-depth, you know, strategic Euro players, I think it's a nice light title that they can sit down and play in a short amount of time, even if you're used to a heavier uh, worker placement style of game. So Stone Age from Rio Grande Games, a game I would suggest for almost any level of gamer who wants a great, tight worker placement game. Thanks for watching our review today. For more information about board games, as well as the number one board game audio podcast, check out Dicetower.com for reviews, interviews, and more. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. <laughs>
拜。